am a professor in religious studies and also the director of the new network. Um, but let's jump in here and let me just introduce you to Lisa. Um, it, it is really with great pleasure that I am able to introduce you, Dr. Lisa Keinzel, um, for our second talk here for the new network. Um, Dr. Uh, Keinzel is a postdoctorate researcher in the area of media, religion, and culture at the Institute for Religious Studies and Related didactics at the University of Bremen. She is a member of the Lab for Media and Religion at the Center for Media, Communications and Information Research, and is a member in the Lab Kreislichkisch Abendland, which is Contradictory Discourses of the Christian West. Um, Lisa holds both a PhD in Cultural Anthropology and Religious Studies, which is close to my heart. Um, and since 2018, she's worked as a researcher in the field of literature and media of religions at the Institute for Religious Studies at the University of Bremen. Her research interests include religion and identity, formations in digital media, visual material culture in contemporary and historic settings, qualitative methods such as digital anthropology and the transformation of religion, gender as, as well as the notion of the nation in gaming cultures, um, and there's a lot more too, but I want to give her time to talk. Um, so without further ado, uh, Lisa, please, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So I'm really um, happy to be here today and I will start my screen right away. Just give me one second. So to start my presentation, and then switching. So you should all see my presentation now and not the presenter mode. Um, always a little bit tricky, as I said before, with the two screens um, to get everything where it should be. So um, hello, and I'm really glad that you made it to my talk today. So I'm gonna talk about um, a lot of things, mainly about esports uh, in Europe, so I try to narrow it down a little bit, uh, the research I'm doing, yeah, for the last, yeah, nearly four years. So um, today I'm gonna talk about esports a little bit, like what, what is this huge topic um, that is very, at least in my research world, very present. Um, then how um, nation or the, the notion of the nation, nationalism, how this comes to play within the structure of esports. So of course we can understand video games and gaming cultures in, in general as expression of uh, globalized media cultures. Um, and of course that is also relevant for esports, but we have also uh, keep in mind that they are entangled um, with their socio-political, with their context, with different discourses in specific countries. And we have to keep that in mind when we are um, researching that and, and looking at it, analyzing it. And especially in the field of esports, um, that is important because there are so many different players and uh, stakeholders, international organizations, multinational teams. We have fans, we have the audience um, that play a central role in these discourses. So we have to look at a lot of different layers within this global phenomenon. And today I will talk about, um, so esports in general a little bit uh, as an introduction, then um, I will talk how uh, regions and nations come into play within the competition structure of esports, focusing on Europe. A third point will be around the notion of the nation, um, so the concept, the category of the nation in and around uh, esports tournaments, and finally politics and esports. So, um, now we have the next slide. So, esports. The worldwide audience for esports was estimated for uh, 2021, so for last year, with around 474 million people. So, that is a lot. So, you probably all know about esports, you have heard about esports by now. Um, but how can we define it? Like, what is it? 
So um, Yuvo Hamari and Max Schürblom defined it as um, a form of sports where the primary aspect of the sport are facilitated by electronic systems. So we have this human and um, computer interface that is really in the center of their definition. And of course, it is the competitive gaming, it is the competitive video gaming that is mostly also broadcasted um, on, for example, Twitch, so on the internet. And it is, of course, um, located in, in very different areas around the world. So we have small tournaments, we have really big events. So you may think, or if you do research in the area, you probably know, but if you think about esports, it sounds quite like a recent development, right? But it's not that new. So the beginning is also, or goes back as far as the 1970s. So we have this um, early scientific institutions and universities that dealt with um, computers in general, with um, very early forms of the internet. And this is also the setting or the, the environment where um, esports was born, so to speak. So in uh, 1972, Stuart Brand, a writer and editor for uh, Rolling Stones at the time, organized an event with students and researchers, the first intergalactic space war Olympics. Um, it was held at the Stanford Artificial uh, Intel Intelligence Lab. And yeah, the arcade game Space Force was in the center of this tournament. And the winner got a free subscription for the um, Rolling Stones magazine. So quite different than um, prize money that is awarded nowadays um, for esports tournaments. Um, also that went on in the 1980s. So we have this very, um, or this first very big um, tournament, uh, the 1980 Space Invaders Championship that is really something that uh, like a cornerstone in the 80s, more than 10,000 participants, um, but yeah, participated in this um, event that was organized by Atari. So we see, okay, there is a progression. And especially in the 1990s, with the increasing spread of the internet, they, um, this possibility that you could connect with other players, but also through local networks, um, LAN parties, if you grew up in the 90s, you probably have been to one. Um, so LAN parties became really popular. And I just named one really iconic event, uh, QuakeCon 1996 in Texas. So to have some uh, stations in this history of esports. So, okay, we see with especially the spread of the internet, esports became um, global, global competitions were possible. and by that also esports organizations established. So uh, it was now possible to compete in several tournaments and leagues at the same times. If you are a big organization and you have esports teams in different um, games for, for different esports titles. For example, um, if you look at Germany, there is um, the esports club or organization big. So it's Berlin International Gaming big. And it's, um, it has, I think, more or nearly 10 teams. So they have CSGO, they have League of Legends, they have a team in Valorant, in Quake, in Trackmania, in StarCraft 2, in Tekken, and in PUBG Mobile. Okay, so that eight different teams. And they don't only, uh, they not only have an esports team, but they also have uh, they support streamers, they organize their own league in the area of Germany, Austria and Switzerland. So um, they are a big organization and, and organizations like that or clubs like that are um, of, developed through uh, different areas and in time. If you are asking yourself now, okay, I get that there are regional so to speak, organizations, they are located in a specific region. But aren't these games, these titles that people play in esports developed in a global setting with a global team behind them? And is esports itself not really a global phenomenon? Yes, I would agree. Um, however, 
if you look at these events and the structures of esports, we see that um, the category of the nation, so to speak, or the notion of the nation comes into play in different forms. So um, as I said before, I want to talk about a few aspects. So the competition structure, like regions and nations, how they are important for the structure of esports tournaments and tournaments themselves, and then politics and esports, like broader society discourses. Okay, so um, before we do that, of course, if we think or if we talk about um, the nation, nationalism, maybe, um, probably, um, if you are doing research in the area, um, Anderson's idea of imagined communities come to your mind. And the first definition here on the slide you see is his uh, proposed definition of the nation as, quote, an imagined political community and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign, end quote. So even though um, this idea of the imagined community is really um, written in his, his work in, in the 80s, I think also in other um, approaches from history, sociology, political science uh, in the 1980s, this idea, this um, concept of people thinking about imagining um, it, it was really, really important. And by um, acknowledging that this importance of the in and exclusion discourses and the negotiation of identity that is connected to nation building processes is really important also in the research I'm doing. So um, even though um, I think it is important that we use or still think about Anderson's definition of the imagined communities. I also agree um, with Brew Baker, who argues that we uh, should think about the category of the nation as the object of the analysis, um, rather as of the tool of the analysis. So. As the second quote on the slide shows you, he asks not what is a nation, so how you, we can define it, but how does nation work as a category of practice, a political idiom, a claim, for example. Um, so that is really important. And it's not, or he argues not that it is important that we should answer normative questions about the use of the category of the nation, but rather put in focus relevant social actors and practices and settings um, where this idea of the, no of the nation or this uh, concept, this category of the nation comes into play. And that is, as I would argue, also in the setting of um, global video gaming um, cultures and also in the setting of um, esports. So if we look at esports, um, if you're familiar with esports, you know that there are a ton of different um, esports titles we can look at. Um, I want to focus down, or also in my research, I'm focusing down especially on the most popular esports titles worldwide. Of course, it is not that easy to narrow it down. Statistics are various um, in, in different countries, but it is clear if you look at most popular and with also um, on the most played um, esports titles worldwide. So um, there are three, especially three titles stand out. And this is League of Legends, Dota 2 and CSGO. So League of Legends um, was uh, developed and published by Riot Games in um, 2009. It is a multiplayer online battle arena, so a MOBA game. And um, the esports structure is that five um, players in, in two teams play against each other. They have different roles. And the goal is to de destroy the objectives and conquer the opponent's base and destroy the Nexus. Um, Dota 2 uh, is also a mobile game. 
uh, developed by Valve in 2013, and it has a similar structure, similar idea. You also have these two teams and also try to uh, destroy the structure in the other team's area. Different um, is Counter-Strike. Um, so it is a multiplayer first-person shooter and it was developed by Valve and Hidden Path Entertainment and published by Valve in 2012. Um, but also here we have two teams, five players that compete against each other. But in this case, you have to defuse a bomb. So just to give you the, the basic um, ground rules of how these titles work. And as you have heard, of course, uh, or as you could sit, think of, um, these esports titles are video games themselves. So you can play them as a single player, etc. You can play them with friends, but you can also play them on an esports level. So of course we have uh, different gaming companies that have um, an interest here and that hold really significant stakes in the industry. So in the esports industry, for example, in 2021, 20, uh, Activision Blizzard, uh, Valve, we heard of them uh, already, and Riot Games are three of the top 10 uh, companies um, that hold stakes in the esports industry. So they are really important. And besides them, um, because they are important because they also organize events. Besides them, we also have various esports organizations um, that are not developers, but that organize uh, events or leagues. For example, ESL, um, is one of the biggest ones. It, is, um, it has its headquarters in Germany and was founded in 2000. And um, we will hear, hear about um, this company or this organization later on in the talk again. So, okay, we established now, we have different titles. We know a little bit more about these three titles I just talked about, but still it's very global. So how is esports connected to regional contexts such as Europe as advertised in my talk? So esports structures are of course similar to other sports structures. So we have worldwide championships, we have regional and national leagues, but there is no overarching world association in esports. So we have various um, national and international associations exist side by side. And um, even though it is this worldwide structure, the regional and the national leagues are very important because um, as you can think of, similar as in other sports, the, the top is really, there are not that many players, there are not that many teams that are can compete on the top level worldwide. But of course, as you get go down um, regional and national leagues, there are a lot of more um, competition and there are a lot more players, a lot more teams, organization, you have small clubs. Um, so of course, there are, um, there's a lot of engagement there. And um, before I go into the structure in detail, I also want to point out that if we talk about Europe, um, of course, you, you probably all have something in mind. Some of you I know are here in the talk today have uh, are from Europe. So you have maybe a different perspective than people that are not from Europe. Um, but depending on what you've heard, what your education is, what your ideas are, what your connection to the region is, you have probably all of you have different images, but you have this image, you have this idea of what Europe is. And it's, it's similar to the idea of the nation um, where something comes into our mind. That is also the, the uh, thing with Europe. So we have something in mind and we think, okay, yeah, Europe, that, that's cl clearly definable. That's a geographic region. We can, we can painted on the map and, and draw a line and then we know this is Europe. I, or, I also did something like that um, on the presentation here. So you see something that you will recognize as Europe on, on the one side of the presentation here. But even though um, there is something there, we can discuss if that is, um, if that is Europe for all of us. Because even though um, we can define Europe geographically, that is not something that is consistent. It changed over time. So especially the border um, in Eastern Europe changed over time. So uh, going as far as the Ural Mountains, then that's definitely not the line in my um, graph here, in my icon here. So um, 
we also see that you, um, this um, geography-based um, construction of Europe is also only a social construction, even though it, it maybe focuses on landmarks. The same goes um, if we try to define Europe based on historic events or supposedly shared values. Um, for example, um, the Enlightenment, human rights, or even religion. So um, that is all. Um, that are all aspects that we have to keep in mind if we think about um, Europe and if we think about um, this construction of Europe also when we talk about esports. Because um, if we now look at how um, Europe is defined within these esports titles, I talked before, so League of Legends, Dota 2 and CSGO. So we see, for example, if we look at um, Counter-Strike, we see that they define um, the regional major rankings, that is RMR in the beginning of the quote here. So the RMR region roughly corresponds to their geographic equivalent. Okay, roughly corresponds is interesting. So either there is like a definition or there is not. But um, the, the, the vote goes further, it's, it, the rule book is, is quite long, so they, uh, they further elaborate, okay, that um, if you are on the edges of this roughly defined region, then you can um, go to the region where it's um, the lowest latency for the qualifiers, and there are three regions in general, so there's Europe, America, and Asia. So um, looking further um, at Europe, if we see, um, for example, ESL, we talked about them, a big event organizer, they um, defined in their uh, tour, um, in their ESL Pro Tour, also for Counter-Strike, in their rules, that for ESL events, the world is divided into three main regions, which are as follows, Americas and Antarctica, Asia and Australia and Oceania, Europe and Africa. So we see, even though we look at the same esports title, there are different organizers, there are different um, esports leagues, and they have not that similar um, of a definition of Europe. Um, also, if you think, for example, um, League of Legends, it's also divided similarly in, in worldwide leagues and in different regions, we also have Europe. And there, Israel is part of the EU, competi EU competitive region. So, of course, we can argue um, that Israel is part of Europe, but that is, again, another definition. So, we have to keep that in mind if we look at esports in general and the categories they are using, that they are defined in the e different esports titles and in the different um, yeah, organizers or leagues. And if we go even further in this competition structure of regions and nations, um, we also see that, for example, uh, Riot uh, for League of Legends established an import rule in 2014 that regulates how many players from other regions can play in the regional team's active roster. So player transfer is possible, but um, the argument here uh, for this rule is that they want to ensure that people in all regions can um, have a chance to play esports in their region. So um, at least three out of the five players on the start line uh, of a team are required to be residents of the EU competitive region. So this is the rule book for Europe again. Um, that is the one we are focusing on. So um, we see again that the regional or the sometimes even national aspect is important in the team um, structure and in the tournament structure, if we see like the categories that are used and if we see how players are able to um, navigate and move between different regions that are defined within sports structure. Again, very oriented uh, similarly or um, copying like regular sports structures. If we look at tournaments um, in specific, if you think about before COVID-19 maybe, so you had this big events, you had um, 
big sites, um, stadiums, um, on site, and of course, an online part. You still have the online part today. Um, the the on site part will hopefully um, come back again. And you had this on site and online uh, aspects of communication, of visuals, of language um, from the commentators, from um, the fans. So you had these different aspects how uh, people can simultaneously, like uh, during the match, but also before the match and after the match, negotiate. Um, their approach towards, um, of course, esports. That is the, that is the main topic. But also uh, stuff like um, the national identity that people bring to such an event. Because similar uh, as in other sports, in traditional sports, so to speak, um, we also see um, nationality um, and nationalism in esports. So. If you think about sports and um, nationalism, you probably think of maybe soccer, if you're from Europe or other regions, or you think of football, you think of uh, fans waving flags. And that is also something that happens in esports events on site. So you have people waving flags, you have um, people shouting for their team in their um, native language. And um, as especially um, with this online component um, to esports, we have this really interesting aspect that we have, for example, in a Twitch live stream, we have a live chat um, that also give people the opportunity to talk about and um, to um, yeah discuss stuff like also. Um, national aspects of their fandom or of the teams playing. So um, Rika Turtjainen, Uspa Freeman and Maria Putzuleinen um, found in their study, they did a really interesting study in 2020, where they compared the 2014 FIFA World Cup with the Overwatch World Cup from 2016. And they found that there are really, um, esports is clearly following the structure of traditional sports broadcasts, also including national symbols and languages like um, especially the flags, but also in the chats, um, that is something that really comes to play within esports. Um, I did um, during the last, I think, yeah, three to four years now, um, research in especially the German speaking area of Europe and um, looked at how uh, especially fans engage with esports and what um, they think about this aspects of nationality, um, identity that come to play, especially also I'm really interested in values that were discussed, um, not only national identity constructions, but also other aspects of values. Um, and I think that is really interesting because when you look at um, fandom and esports, it, it becomes clear that people are interested in it because it, they identify with the culture or they watch it because they like the athletes, they like the emotional atmosphere um, in the tournaments. And what comes or what, what did come um, or, or become very visible in my research during the last years was that people repeatedly told me that they are a fan, for example, of a club because it is German. So um, the first quote I have here is from a German um, or an esports fan in Germany that told me that he is a fan of BIG, we heard of them, the Berlin um, club, because it is a German club. And um, also, especially in the German speaking area, the discussion of or the importance of recognizing esports as a sport is still a huge discussion in society. So um, another fan told me that esports should also gain more importance in Germany to show respect towards people that are professional players and to support them like other athletes. That is of course a big topic, but on the other hand, their representative of the National Esports Association um, in an interview, um, for example, told me that, for example, especially for uh, shooter games, it is difficult because 
sport. Um, and there are certain values that we as a national sports association, of course, cannot support. And there we have, again, this um, value discussion that come into light. Um, if you're interested in fandom, um, esports, um, nationalism, there's really uh, great research from Iman Esmangil or Simon Ho on Dota 2 or League of Legends. And I think also Overwatch, um, what I mentioned before, is really interesting. And this focus on the research on Europe and European countries is, is something that is really important and needs to be um, more in the, in the light of research. But if we are going to our last point now, um, politics and esports, um, there are big discourses in Europe um, focusing on the question if esports is sport, as I said before. So we established that there are international multi billion dollar um, organizations, it's a big industry. And, but also, these national stakeholders and organizations are interest or have interest in these developments. So I just had um, three examples. So two short ones and a little bit longer one. So first of all, Denmark um, has published a national esports strategy in 2019, stating that the integrity of esports, but also the commercial development opportunities for growth, entrepreneurship and employment in esports in Denmark needs to be supported. And that was published by the Danish Ministry of, of Culture. And in the same year that then Danish Prime Minister Lars Løkke Rasmussen visited Australis, um, the CSGO team, um, the Danish CSGO team, and played uh, Counter-Strike with them. So, of course, it was a well-orchestrated um, visit there, um, but it was well-received also in the gaming community. And, that, and I analyzed um, this online discussion uh, about the events on social media. So, um, and especially friends, fans from other countries highlighted in the comment sections there that Denmark is some kind of a best practice uh, example for them how to engage with esports and that they um, un or they underlined the need for their countries to follow that lead. And um, the second example um, from Austria. Uh, even though uh, Austria is not or has not officially acknowledged esports as a sport, um, in June 2021, uh, so last year, um, the Defense Minister Claudia Tanner presented an esports player and athlete um, as sponsored by the Army Sports Center of the Austrian Armed Forces. Um, if you're thinking about different esports titles, um, he's playing FIFA. So um, he's playing like professional soccer in international and national com uh, competitions. But that is really interesting from uh, the entanglement of politics and also of, of states with esports. And finally, um, unfortunately, due to the uh, developments in the last uh, month nearly now, um, also the entanglement of politics, uh, esports and the Ukrainian war um, came to my attention, of course, because um, it has, it has um, implications for this relationship, for these discourses, and also um, for, uh, of course, um, the structure of esports or esports events. So maybe you saw um, the open letter from the um, Ukrainian um, Deputy Prime Minister Mikhail Fedorov, um, he's also the, part of the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, and he um, appealed to games companies in the beginning of March um, to temporarily stop the participant, participation of Russian and Belarusian teams and gamers in all international esports events and cancel all international e events holding on the territory of Russia and Belarus. And further, in another tweet, he urged game companies, for example, Riot, to close their offices in Russia. So we, we see that, of course, um, different um, esports titles were postponed. So the Eastern European um, League for Dota 2, for example, and uh, Dota 2, so Valve, 
the, the company behind it also stated on their uh, website that they are um, due to these terrible um, developments, they don't want to have their Eastern European League happening now, or they cannot see it happening, but they made a very inclusive statement that um, the quote you see here, the very name of the international, like the, uh, the competition itself, is a testament to a shared celebration of sport that connects people of every nation into a single community of passionate fans. So addressing these different layers of esports and also highlighting um, people from different nations. But that was not the only reaction. Um, ESL, we heard about them um, before, they um, postponed, of course, also um, their regional uh, tournaments, but they also um, made sanctions against, against Russian organizations. So um, the second quote refers directly to two teams they identified in their statement who will not be allowed to be represented in the tournaments. And what I found very interesting was that um, they recognized, of course, that the players are not responsible for the situation and they would allow them to participate in the tournaments, but only, and that is the quote now, um, are welcome to compete under a neutral name without representing their country, organization, or the team's sponsors on the clothing or otherwise. So we have um, this very aspect of um, symbols, of national symbols, and also of political ties, of economical ties that are addressed here. And um, to uh, close my thoughts on, on this very broad topic, I think we see that the notion of the nation, that national uh, ideas, that nationalism is a very um, present topic, especially when you look at uh, current developments in our world. And even though esports is a globalized phenomenon, it is highly entangled in these socio-political and contextual discourses. And um, nationality and the notion of the nation, the category of regions, um, they, they come to play in very different ways within the field. So we have these different individuals, we have groups, we have this human technology interaction. And we see that in esports events and the structure of esports, this notion of the nation, this idea um, comes to play in competition structures um, in uh, and around tournaments um, with uh, fan culture, but also and especially um, very um, recent in the politics and esports connection in the uh, discourses that are connected to that. So um, these were my thoughts. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm really looking forward um, for our discussion. So thank you. I just want to I just want to say since this is our, our one of our first talks, and since we've got a person from the German cultural region, I think we should all do our desks. Yes, that's nice. Yeah. Make you feel at home here in the in the virtual land. So please, um, if you have questions for, for Lisa, put them in the chat, or if you wanna raise your hand, John will call on you. Um, and it was a really great talk. And so I'm sure everyone has some really good questions. So please um, feel free to ask. Yeah, Nick, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just ask one to kind of toss it out there and get it started, but I don't want to spend too much time. I, as I was listening to your conversation, I, I put some notes in the chat about the how interesting it is that there aren't many sports that take such a broad view on what a nation or what a collection would be. And, and I was curious to hear, in some ways, I mean, the reconciliation seems to be we're still developing critical mass. We're still trying to figure out who's actually participating. But the reason I bring it up is it seems to potentially contrast with, for example, in the Asian games, where I think they've already had one round of esports competition. And I think this year's Asia games in China are going to have esports as a competition. And then, of course, there's been the natural conversation about the IOC and the Olympics, with some suggestions that perhaps in 2028 there could be demonstration sports. And then I think there were some 
action around Tokyo. And I was wondering if and how those two areas get reconciled, especially because we know that the absence of governing bodies, and we can critique governing bodies, of course, that's a really unique delineator when we think about sports as the banner, right? So a couple of thought streams in there. I was hoping you can help me put them together. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think that is that is maybe also a reason why the research in the last years was mainly focused on Asia, on, of course, the developments um, there. And now it, it, it shifts towards Europe, towards Northern America, because we see now maybe similar developments like a few years back um, that we know from Asia. And also we, we see this um, debates, for example, especially in the German speaking area, this uh, discussion of the value of sports is, is really big. So uh, this ego shooter problem that is, is a very political one, um, that is exponentially bigger in the German speaking area than in, for example, uh, Northern uh, Europe, for example, in Scandinavia, it's not that big of a deal. You have their CSGO um, uh, um, uh, tournaments for, yeah, not, not children, but you have kind of summer camps where people go and, and people send their children to and they don't have a problem with that. So that is uh, uh, definitely um, um, this, this connection to political discussions. And also I think what is really interesting since you mentioned like this um, governmental structures and this idea that you don't have that many regulations coming from the state, but now it is really um, tr going into this direction that especially in, um, for example, in Germany, there's this huge debate. Um, there is this um, esports association and, um, developers and also organizations, for example, ESL uh, and, and others, they, they discuss like who represents who, like who, we are not part of that um, this association. For example, the newly um, founded European Esports Association. So it is this development, I think, especially coming from politics to have more influence in this area and also establish um, maybe a national esports strategy such as Denmark did, because they see the, the potential, the economic potential. But then you have the, the tournament and league structure and you have the organizers that are already here and, and it's a thriving um, industry. And I think there are um, polarizing aspects here. I'd be broadly curious to see how it tracks with the development of recent sports. I'm thinking of like extreme games to snowboarding to Olympic sport and the extent to which some of the same issues of value and issues of investment. I wonder if there are some parallel lines of inquiry there or if they're just so separate. And like Kirsten put in the chat, you have the added debate not only over our game serious, but then we have the moral panics around video games. And it sounds like all of those things are conspiring. It's, it seems like a neat time to be investigating this because as you, as you said, it's, we're still several years out from it being established yet in some places it's very established. Yes, I think, and, and that especially is the, the really interesting part of all of this. Um, also, like all this discussion about um, esports becoming Olympic, you mentioned the Asian Asian Games. Um, I think that that is really interesting. Also, of course, Asia is an interesting region, but I think Europe and also Northern America is really interesting because it is not at that point yet. Thank you very much. Yeah, Kirsten, do you have a, your hand up still? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for this uh, overview. I was really intrigued by, um, of course, this doing nation idea. And I was thinking about the that now is the time as a perfect example for undoing nation. The thing like like a counter process of, oh, OK, it's really politically not correct if we are going under the label nation. So we have to make an undoing nation. So this would be an interesting theoretical um, enhancement, so to speak, to think about this a little bit more. And uh, one question really is for me, is it typical for sports as such, because we can see the same processes in the Olympics, in the soccer, whatever, 
the undoing a nation, be, being neutral, being like, oh no, we are not, uh, we are playing, but not as a nation. Or is there something really specific about esports, or is it just an just in quotation mark an imitation? Because from what I um, uh, know about your research, that they really want to to be labeled as a real sport, and therefore really, to, uh, in some uh, ways, imitating the values of sports. And this would be in. For, for me, my question, that's it. Yeah, um, I think from an analytical perspective, uh, I would totally agree. So, um, but I think if, if you look at uh, esports or um, the structures in general, um, if you look at the um, International um, Esports um, Association, they have, they um, organize these world championship where um, esports teams from nations uh, compete against each other. And I think I found that really interesting that that is the direction um, they are going also on an international level. So even because if you look at the um, more regional um, let's call it regional um, leagues, um, there you have these teams and teams don't um, consist of people only from one nation or from one background. So they are, have different backgrounds and um, different experiences, of course. And it is not that highlighted, but if you again have these um, structures where you compete as national team of one country, I think that again is something that is going into another direction. I, I find this this all or, or this whole concept that this category is even part of esports so interesting because or at least from my perspective it would not have to be that way because esports as such ha gives the opportunity to be something else to not recreate um, construct and 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 maybe copy to put it blindly, but um, these structures that are already there, there is way more potential to do things differently. Um, yeah, so, but I think it is really interesting, yeah. Yeah, Kati. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks so much also from me. That was really super interesting to me um, for many, many reasons. <laughs> and uh, just in conjunction with what you said there in the end, because I was also going to uh, say that I think it's such it's so interesting because it's such a good example, especially with regard to the fan cultures, for how gaming communities uh, tend to sometimes form around the same or similar ideas of community or and also demarcations, um, as in real life, so to speak, like nations, for instance, and it's also similar stuff that we see with gender, for example, um, because, of course, they're not separated from the sociocultural contexts, like you said. Uh, and uh, so that was really interesting, I think. Uh, and what I just wanted to remark uh, with regard to the uh, what, what Brian said earlier about the very broad definition of regions and nations, uh, that's just uh, like a stray observation that came to mind to me. The only thing I can think of that operates similarly is the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, I don't know if the Eurovision Song Contest is a thing that Americans uh, watch or know or like hate watch like we Europeans do. Um, but it's, uh, it's this uh, song contest which has been happening every year since the 50s. Um, and it's supposed to promote like this idea of European unity, like similar to like this Olympic idea, but just with music. Uh, and uh, now there's, uh, there's also a lot of countries in there, like a lot of Commonwealth countries, like Australia, for instance, or Israel is in the song contest, or like a lot of uh, uh, near Asian countries like Azerbaijan and so on. So that was just like an observation that came to mind. Thank you. Yeah, I really like the reference to Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> I think since the movie, it is it's more known also in the US. Yeah, um, but um, closing that up. Uh, no, I think I'm um, going back to esports. Uh, I think it is really interesting um, because you have 
in th therefore I talked about these different titles because of course you have different structures and also different league structures and regional structures within these titles so it there is not one esports um, league or there is not one um, tournament structures but you have these different ones for different titles and then for these titles you again have different organizers and they structure it differently so it is really interesting how um these um, communities construct these regions and how they negotiate what is part of what they're not really negotiated in ways that it is structured that way but fans then negotiate it and that is really interesting for me hey john can i ask a quick question yes you don't have your hand up but okay uh, you know i always forget how to raise my hand in zoom so um so I'm, I'm trying to form a question out of this. It's actually just kind of my curiosity. So I've been watching, um, I've been monitoring and watching mod communities for a long time, you know I mean? And, and it was, and nationalism for the most part never played a part in the modding communities. I just, you never saw it at all. That was up until the Ukraine war. And suddenly nationalism has poked up its head and a lot, um, Russian modders have always had a really big presence on the different, and, and they've been being pushed off of the more mainstream mods, modding communities into more, you know, marginal ones. Have you seen anything like that with the nationalism in the esports community? Or has nationalism always been part of the part of it? I think it, again, depends a little bit also on the title you're looking at. So yeah. I did a lot of research on um, Counter-Strike and there, at least in my experience, it is also depending on the region you're looking at, but it is more present than in other titles. Um, for example, Denmark is really good in Counter-Strike and they also in the media discourse refer to their team because also all of team members are Danish um, as their national team in a way. So, and for example, if there is a tournament um, and you go before the tournament on a Sunday uh, into a bakery, you see whole families dressed in a jersey um, with the flags, the national flags uh, over their shoulder. Um, so this, this nationality or nationalism in fandom is more present in some regions than in others. But I think what um, is or was also before uh, more a topic for um, mainly looking at fans or um, the audience that people are coming from some region or they understand this team as a representative of this region and therefore ascribe this meaning to that, even though maybe these um, players or the team or the organization didn't have that in mind. I think it was more present um, in esports before, but again, you have to differentiate extremely. So we're, we're coming up here on the end of the hour. Does anyone have a burning question they want to ask? So um, we're going to, we'll keep the chat going for, or we'll keep the Zoom going for a while. So if people want to talk with Lisa more informally, feel free to do that. Um, if not, I, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and we, we both appreciate your support and we also appreciate um, your questions. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, it, it was great. Um, and it was great to hear, you know, we've been talking about this stuff for years. It's nice to see it in a more formal presentation. So um, that said, um, thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.